Happy belated May Day, everybody. I just realized that I forgot to bring the Legos down. Oh, did you make a Maypole? No, I didn't make a Maypole. <laughs> that would have been pretty... That's it's, a hard, it's a hard Lego build. And be, <laughs> it would be a hard Lego build. <laughs> Uh, no, they're at home, so okay, well, that, next that, time. That's okay, you have to get us for the June chat. Welcome to the uh, first, the, a rare first Tuesday of the month designer chat. We uh, did it. Yeah, we did it, finally. Yay. It's like the first month in a while where like, there wasn't travel or weird sickness or confusion. Mm -hmm. So we managed it. But this is the May designer chat where Patrick and I sit down and talk about what's going on at Leader Games. Hey, everybody. I'm Patrick Leader. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, it's been busy. Uh, we've got lots of studios to talk about. Before we get into that, um, Patrick, what have you been playing? Oh, confess. Confess. Um, confess. I taught my my three year old how to play Santorini. Okay. Excellent. Uh, which, prodigy. Prodigy. I mean, he doesn't know how to win. He just knows how to move. So is that enough? To say he knows how to play it? I don't think so, but you, you played with the Santorini pieces. I played with, no. But he, he would move one space and then drop a drop a building. So, go. And then I've been giving him Kronos, who wins if there's five tower, complete towers. Mm -hmm. And then, and can win conventionally, but he's not going to do that. So, And then uh, played some Dark Tower, some D&D. &D, Excellent. And uh, I've been playing Stellarian, which is still set up for Monday out in the lunchroom. And uh, that's about it. For yeah. video games, I've been playing um, sort of Far Cry 6. Is that We're, the cult one? No, it's 5. Okay. Six, 6 breaks their rule that um, they only do first person no matter what in the Far Cry series. Wait, I thought they were only third person games. Oh, they're all first person. Wow. This is, see, I'm telling everybody how much I know about Far Cry. I, I could have not identified Far Cry in a lineup of AAA games. So, so, so three chance. through five, no matter what's going on in the cutscene, they'll find a way to make sure that the person sees it. Okay. And then in six, they were like, ah, that's fine. We'll just have some cutscenes for it. Mm. It's still a person still in it. Uh, I'm playing that, uh, Vampire Survivors, uh, Terra Nil. Yep. And the Reverse City Builder. The Reverse City Builder. And, um, uh, Vampire Survivors, did I say that? Yes. And then I did get back. I'll get back to a little bit of Stellars. There you go. Sounds productive. Yeah. How about you? What are you doing? Uh, so I'm going to UK Game Expo, which uh -huh. I'm very excited about. I've never been to before. So those of you in the UK, if you're going to the show, I hope to see you there. Uh, and because of that, uh, so my wife and I have been putting off this like trip, we've been meaning to go on a trip. We have we've accrued so much, so many babysitter credits by the by our trips constantly getting canceled. Uh, but we're going to try our luck in the Lake District beforehand and kind of tool around the Midlands. So we are playing some Brass Lancashire, kind of get pumped. Oh, reading a lot of Coleridge and Wordsworth, uh, just kind of starting to, to to seep it in, get prepped. The two you're going. Yeah, yes, but well, we're going beforehand, and then I'm going to meet up with Drew and everybody, and then Katie's going to go home. Oh, so right. Katie is not going to the UK Game Expo. Uh, Katie is I'm, coming ahead of, ahead of I know you talked about all the pieces of that, and I had not pieced together what that meant until yeah. this very moment. Yeah, this so. was like delayed and delayed and delayed, but we we're finally we're finally managing it. I'm looking forward to it. So we've been doing that. Um, and then uh, we, because we finished watching the Psychonauts documentary, we've been playing a bunch of Double Fine games, and we started Broken Age, which we had, I'd beaten Broken Age. Uh, but I beat it right when it came out. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, I realized that at about a 10 year remove, or whenever that game came out, I have almost no memory of the game. Mm -hmm. There's like two or three little moments that I can remember, mm -hmm. but I've been surprised at how little I remember the answers to any of the puzzles, so it's been fun to play. Um, so we've been doing that, and then um, I had the, a delightful time last night. So I've been playing a lot of StarCraft the past year. It's really the only video game I play with any regularity. Um, but because I was so in like a 2007 mood, I also played some Counter-Strike last night with some friends, and I still think that game provides the best physical comedy of any, <laughs> of any video game. I think it is so silly, just the way the ragdoll physics work, the way the game is so tense, and then something absurd will happen, or you're like, I don't know where they are, and then like, the door opens, and then the door closes, and the door opens again because the person's on the other side, yeah, opening yeah, yeah. and closing the door. Yeah. Hilarious. Great. Fun, fun time. Um, what a millennial, a boomer, my God. Did dates not mean anything to anyone? 
Um, I think I, I, I would have a hard time imagining my father, who is a legitimate boomer, playing, a boomer, playing yeah, StarCraft. That's fair. Do you play Constant Quest and also Double Fine Game? No, I haven't played. I have a copy of it because mm -hmm. I got the the big bundle to cover the stuff I didn't have. But mm. I have not. I've not played Costume Quest. I played. Um, I played Massive Chalice when it came out, and liked it pretty well. It, like, didn't yeah. quite. I'm not curious. Picture of Massive Chalice looks like. It's like the. It's the. It's the tactical one. It's like almost really good. It's just not. It, I think it has a hard time. Boy, I could talk a long time about Massive Chalice and realizing it has. I think Massive Chalice has. This problem where the core premise is good, but the fundamentals of the design don't support it, and so it kind of like runs out of steam. Like the the game space isn't enough to like generate as many like cool tactical scenarios as you might need. Mm -hmm. It's like the reverse problem of Into the Breach. I thought this was a lot more like Archon than what I'm no, seeing here. It's like very fantasy. Oh, very high fantasy. Well, I mean, all right. Uh, but that's let's that, bring Archon uh, back. Bring what? Archon? Oh, Archon. Yeah. Sorry, when you said Archon, I think you said Arkham. Yeah. Oh, let's bring Arkham. I don't think Arkham is doing very well. No, Archon. Yeah. Archon, yeah. the chess RTS game from like 1990 or something. Yes. Oh, uh, even earlier. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, like 82 or something. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's crazy. Um, that game's a good time. I remember that was in my, my like, uh, Abandonware days, trying desperately to find games like Titan mm -hmm. and then finding that game. 1983, nice. One of the best covers, one of the best covers out. Yeah, it's good. Uh, predates me by three years, that game. So when we're old and retired, and we're bringing back Titan yeah, and Magic Realm, back. we'll also get the rights to Archon to, and bring Archon fun. back, so I'm get, get ready one, whoever has the I'm rights. I'm surprised that one doesn't have like a string of like bad late 90s and early 2000s reboots. It probably Attempts. does. Yeah, yeah it probably yeah. does. Yeah. Like when you like re look at like Battlezone, and you're like, oh yeah, they made like a Battlezone in 2003 that's like, Absurd, you know. My old game was I just looking at that I was like, what? I need to bring this to Cole and see. Like, we're gonna add this to the list of so like uh, of eighties games we're yeah, gonna bring strange, back. Strange games. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's pretty much been it. You know, I've been up to the. I feel like when I'm deep in a project like we are right now, I stop playing new, new things. Usually, I'm just like working on my main thing. Yeah. And then playing the hits. So I had to make an effort to to, yeah, to, to go to, do to, stuff. To yeah. I did um, play. I played some Final Girl. I don't know if I played that since the last time we talked or not. Um, since since I'm too, so like cool. with the new set, it's pretty cool. Yeah, how many scenarios are like eight now? There's or something? Ten. ten. Yeah, there's ten, there's ten scenarios, and then there's two prequels. I I will say as a consumer, because I, I have like a passing interest in Final Girl, mm -hmm. uh, but I know you have it and Nick has it. And as a consumer, every time I walk into the game store, I think like I hate the way this product presents itself, like on the shelf. Right. There's like no clear entry point. The box is cool though. Oh yeah, no. It does the seem... new box is cool. The box looks like there's a. a it comes with a. The map holder is like this. It looks like a VCR. It looks like cassettes underneath it. Yeah, That's so neat. it's pretty cool. Yeah. That's neat. Um, oh, and I did learn how to play Resist, which is very hard, but I, I like it quite a bit. Um, I think Do you recommend I try it? I think you'd like it. Okay. Yeah, it has. Um, it's a little. Because you like the owner room games, I think you'd like it. Where like it is noisy, but it's noisy in that deck yeah. way yeah so like you just have to kind of say like okay this isn't the hand where you're going to do it right um what i like about it more than onerim and more than a lot of other solo games is i feel like i run into the, the this problem with onerim a lot where i just kind of it, it's so abstract mm -hmm. i kind of like lose it a little bit sure. if i'm playing a solo game and it doesn't have any particular storytelling hooks i'll, I'll usually get really bored of it resist is really good at storytelling oh, right? sure. you really feel the beats of the game yeah uh, yeah, it, it is cool. Good game. You know, that, that whole design team, I remain impressed by their work. I can't believe they've made so many fabulous games so quickly. Yeah, that's cool. Um, cool. So the studio, uh, things are busy here. Uh, we finished our selection uh, for the intern program and got all that worked out and have been working our staffing. This is always a funny thing. So we have about 11 people in our office. And then over the summer, when we have you know the two production interns come in, plus sometimes we hire some additional help for one thing or another, uh, it really feels like our staff balloons. Like we have this like almost seasonal element to our work. Mm -hmm. And so like I spent yesterday like working on the schedule and we're cleaning up some offices and getting everything set up to onboard some new folks. I'm really excited to get get them in here and get working on projects. Um, and then we have, I mean, we have four active projects that are getting like a ton of work right now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty busy. It's pretty exciting. And I then, am a little confused. 
Yeah. On our market sometimes. So. Yeah, there's just a, there's a lot a lot going on. We haven't locked our schedule yet for the rest of the year and early next year, but we'll be doing that pretty soon. So that's, you know, I know there are people at the start of the chat I saw that were curious if we're going to announce a Kickstarter. Not quite yet, but possibly in the next, you know, the next design chat or the one after that. Yeah, um, possibly. Yeah, I think we're, we're getting... And then uh, some of our team was at Gamma. Uh, hanging out with the Gamma people. Gamma is a weird show. I know, like a lot of people in the chat might not have even heard of it. It's a mostly an industry show where distributors, retailers, and publishers hang out. Yeah. Out in Reno. Yeah. Play the slots. I, I uh, don't know. Do whatever people do in Reno. Go play disc golf. Right. Uh, as Marshall did. Um, not our employee, but uh, the Daryl employee. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Marshall. Yeah. He, um, I just saw he's he posted about it on Facebook. <laughs> Uh, and then play slots, go hiking. I saw yeah, some seems, hiking. Yeah, it seems really Getting like COVID, nice. I saw also. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, cool. Uh, yeah, so Gamma and then interns. Yeah, interns, and then, and then we're prepping our summer schedule. We're going to have a staff at Origins. I know, so this is May, so we really only have one more design chat before Origins. Uh-huh. So uh, myself and Clay are going to be at UK Game Expo, mm-hmm. and then we'll have um, a team at Origins. I will not be. Are you going to be at Origins? I will be. Okay. So Patrick will be at Origins. I will not be at Origins. Uh, and then um, about half of the team will be at Gen Con, mm-hmm. including me. Including me. And uh, then and uh, Kyle will be at Gen Con. And then RootCon so. will be two weeks after. And then we, and then RootCon. And then I think I'll be at BGG Con. I probably will skip Unplugged this year because I'll be. At BGG kind of the previous week. Sure. But haven't figured that out yet. We haven't gotten to our, our fall. I demand you be unplugged. Uh, I did that. I did the double header once. Yeah. It was, a, it was a ride. It was a rough ride. Um, oh, I did one too. Where, that PAX East to South by Southwest South South South, uh, yeah. first year. Yeah, it's never, it's Ooh, never, never fun. It's spicy. Never fun. <laughs> and Alice was like still a baby, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we had uh, the, I, the, the most noteworthy part to me was that we got snowed in Boston. And then we were we were gonna stay at a, a suburban hotel in Austin and then move into the city limits to, to go to the show because because the, the way the shows turn over right. there was a, there wasn't hotels and we had uh, that hotel had laundry like a laundromat built into it so we were gonna go do our laundry like mid trip mm-hmm. and then have clothing to wear the second half and then um, we got snowed in so we did, we lost that day. So we, oh, no. so we didn't have any clothes to wear that. I was kind of grubby by the end of that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's always it's always rough, dude. But I think that, you know, with BGG Con, I really love BGG Con. It is a weird, like it's not a show that we ever like attend professionally, right? Because you don't really sell there. Right. But I think I'm going to have stuff that I'll want to test. Sure. Um, so I want to use the show for for, for testing. Cool. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, the the show outlook, uh, and of course, you and I are both working on our games. We're very busy. I kind of just shut off the rest of reality. Yeah, so that's that's how it goes. That's how it goes. So, and let's talk. Uh, let's talk about how it's going then. How is uh, Arcs going? Arcs is really good. This is um, all new information to me. I haven't oh yeah, talked to no, I haven't talked to Cole in well, literally and, a month. It, and it's almost time for you to play it. Yeah. I think we're getting real close. We. Um, we played a campaign game with Kyle last week, and it had been like a few months since, yeah, he, had, since he had I'll played. Run that too, yeah. Which is, you know, it's just it's it's about it's just about time. Um, you know, one thing that happens uh, when you work on these projects is, as you get into the more technical and difficult parts of a project, you shrink your team to about as small as it can be because that means fewer less time teaching, which means more time just doing hard, you know, actual development. And with with arcs. We got right to the like core. Basically, it was just myself and Josh and Andrea and Nick playing regularly, and we we were playing once or twice a week. And Arcs is a, is a, is a long game. If you're playing full campaigns, um, and it was great because I got a ton of work done. But now we're we're, we're kind of coming out a little bit. So yeah. here's the here's the overview of where Arcs is at. Um, I'm going to kind of start from like the farthest possible zoom. Uh, so we now have a date when we think we're going to be done. That was not true the last time I talked to you all. I'm not going to tell you the date because we're <laughs> not totally sure that it's the right date. But we think we know how long it's going to take to finish the project. Um, and we are in that basically that kind of um, second to last step where like 
the second to last step is like the landing of the plane, and then the last step is the getting off the plane, right? Sure. So it's going to take a few months to do this landing part. And by landing, what I mean is uh, final balancing, content review, uh, usability studies, playing this with, with people who've never played it, teaching the game, setting up the game, packing up the game, setting it up again, packing it up again, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, that's good. That, that will literally take months. Uh, also, during this process, we do have final art coming in. Uh, we do final editorial passes. We, we um, lock down exactly how big the boxes are going to be, all that stuff. Once that's done, uh, it will take us probably about two months to submit all the files to the factory. Um, that's, uh, it, it's a little bit less than that, and these two processes overlap a little bit, but for a project this large, that pre press stage is going to be pretty exhaustive. Now, we don't know precisely when we're going to have all this done. We're figuring that out now. My guess is we're going to miss our Kickstarter date by like a little bit potentially, but we'll know more about that when we get uh, when we get a little further along. So th th there'll be like a comprehensive schedule update for the Kickstarter backers probably in a month or two, but we're not we're not quite sure how it's all going to sort out. So that's all happening kind of at the high level. Now let's zoom in and talk about specifics. Uh, what, one of the things that we are working on right now is cleaning up the game. And what we're doing is we're trying to get everything. So, the, sorry, let me rewind that for a second. The biggest date that I'm working towards, and this is a date I can share with you all now, is something like May 25th, 26th, is when we want to release the full campaign to everybody, to the backers, to anybody who wants to play it. Uh, we did the same thing with Oath, where we kind of do this big early access, like public beta, where anybody who wants to play the game can do it. We think we're going to have it ready by the end of May, probably as early as the 24th, 25th, 26th, somewhere around around there. Uh, I'm not I'm not worried about it, honestly. We could probably release it next week or the week after, but Josh is going to be coming to visit us in a couple weeks. We're going to be doing a lot of in person testing, and I just want to put a little bit more polish before we get it out and get it out to everybody. Um, so that means the work that we're doing right now is mostly cleanup work. It's actually, this is my favorite stage of development. I love, I love the process of development because it's a place where you just get to get really uh, detail-oriented and look for places where you can clean up big sections of the game um, without, you know, without sacrificing uh, too much of, of the game's complexity. So we're, we're doing that at the same time we're also doing um, a lot of usability work in terms of how the game communicates itself. So what I actually want to talk about is I'll show you some examples of the usability work and some examples of the rules cleanup. So for the usability work, uh, ARCS has this very funny problem, which is uh, when you sit down to play ARCS, you have to play these plot lines. And when you opt to play a plot line, you're making a decision about like which character you're going to play in a MOBA or which faction you're going to play in a game like Root. How can a player know what the correct decision is? When, when you play uh, Root in the advanced draft, you've probably played all the factions before, or a big chunk of them. And when you've played, when you play your first game of Root, we've got all the documents on the back of the player boards, and people have strategy guides. There's a lot that you can use to like, inform what faction you want to play. And with ARCs, we've never had that. So after a lot of work, we have re, um, we've kind of worked on addressing this in a few different ways. Um, the way we decided to explain it was instead of telling people about the cool special powers they were going to unlock, we framed every plot line as essentially like a gambit, uh -huh. which is to say like you have a path to power. It's going to cost you some things in the early game. You're going to be spending power and spending your actions to sort of complete your objective. And then the third objective, you get access to another way of scoring. Uh -huh. So you like make the investment and then you get to re reap the benefit. Now, the way we've tried to communicate that is by using the, these fate cards, these plot line cards. So Andrew, if you want to put them up, the plot cards, here we go. So what, what you can see right here, I'm hiding behind this, um, is these are, this is the evolution of the plot line cards. So the one on the far left uh, just has like a line of flavor text. And originally I thought like this would be enough. We have a line of flavor text, that's fun. You kind of get the vibe. And then maybe we have a QR code or a link or some kind of online resource that players can go to to learn more about the, about the, uh, about the plot line. And that might still be possible. And what, then what we did is we realized players want to know kind of what they're going to have to do in each of the three steps. So we decided to go, take these cards from poker cards to tarot cards and put the three steps down. 
Uh, but what we kept running into is when players were first playing the game, those steps, which I can't quite read from here, but I don't need to worry about it, so don't try to zoom in or anything. Um, what those steps did is they made it a little hard to understand. Like it would say, like you need to place ideals on ambitions, and you're like, what does that mean? Sure. These are all, and, and these are terms that are explained in, in cards in the actual fate plotline box. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to evaluate which plotline you should do, that's not enough information. And so we did a rewrite on these tarot cards, where basically I tried to ground every step using verbs and nouns from the game, and then also use little icons to flag like, hey, this is introducing a new card. Right. You're going to like declare, like you're gonna place these markers on ambitions, you do that with the help of this card, this is how you're gonna like do this thing. And it was, it was, it was an interesting uh, exercise in trying to boil every act of a plot line into like two to three sentences of kind of like dense prose mm -hmm. uh, with, with some helpful icons. So you can take it down now. But that's just that's just a sense of like some of the usability work that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is extended to cleaning up the map layout, cleaning up the punch board, just, you know, basically yeah. every, every week um, the ARCS dev team like looks at the table and says like, okay, what element of this game can we hide? Mm -hmm. Can we just sort of like eliminate, throw away, all that kind of stuff? So on that note, we actually have been working on a rework of the uh, event cards and intermission. And the way this works is we had this intermission step that involved the resolution of these crisis cards, which I really liked, but what was happening is it was taking a little bit too long, long to do and it was a little bit too much of a flow break. Um, and the, the question that kept kind of like haunting me was like, this is stuff that should happen within the game. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting it off to the end of the game mostly because of the core event system. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we've been doing is changing how the hazards and crisis works, uh, crises work in the game to make them a little bit more um, fluid. And so we have these new event cards. And Andrew, you can bring up that event card. I'll just kind of show you how this works like this, I can point at different elements. Um, so at various points in the game, there are hazard rolls that you have to take. And when a hazard roll is triggered, you roll two dice, if one of them is a starburst, the hazard triggers. That means blight is gonna do damage. If there are pirates on the map, they're gonna attack, all that stuff. In addition, uh, you will check any of the cards in the court to see if, if they're hazard triggers. So this, the left icon on the, on the top of this card is a starburst, that means if the starburst, the hazard, symbol triggered, then we resolve hazards. And then the four plus refers to the second event die, which is just a numbered die. So that, you know this is only gonna happen a quarter of the time or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then you resolve the hazard text. In this case, it's clearing out the court, doing all kinds of things. So players will be fighting on these court cards for these events, but the events aren't just gonna sit there until the end of the game or until someone discards them. They get randomly triggered. And when they get randomly triggered, they have an effect that's usually a little bit, a little bit more devastating. Mm -hmm. So a player could say like, okay, I don't want this event to trigger, so I'm going to get my influence on it, I'm gonna secure it. And then usually they'll get a benefit. Sometimes the only benefit is just burying the card deeper in the deck. Sure. Uh, you can take the card down now. Um, so that just gives you a sense of like how we built the crisis stuff into the actual game itself. And we've actually pretty dramatically simplified uh, the way the events are resolved. Um, we, I don't even think I have, I, I, I share, I have an example of that, but I'll be sharing that probably a lot about the events next week, not next week, next month. Um, I'll do like a full teardown of, of the events and all, all the stuff related to them. Second but week of May podcast. Broadcast. Broadcast, yeah, Sorry, we can. <laughs> we, we can't. I'm too busy. Uh, but probably in the June broadcast, I'll talk a lot about the about the event system and how it's gotten cleaned up. We're a little bit in the middle of the cleanup right now, too, so it would make sense to just... So things will change. Bit. Yeah, the, the things will change, or even if they stay the same, they're going to get a little bit more polished. Um, sure. And, and that's, you know, that, that's kind of the main stuff that's happening in Arxland. The really exciting thing uh, that we'll be showing you all later this week, I hope, is the board. Uh, Kyle's been hard at work on the board. Uh -huh. Actually, everybody's been hard at work at the board. Patty's done a ton of great work on it. And I'm hoping that we have uh, something to share with you all later this week. And then if we miss that, know that when we release this kit towards the end of May, you will see a totally new board that you have not seen before. And I think it is going to surprise and delight a lot of you.
Um, I I gave vague descriptions of what I wanted a board to look like, so I want credit for having worked on this. There you also, go. Yeah. yeah, Patrick yeah. also worked on the board. Also, a vague description. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, what is clean? I'll say the, the thing about cleaning up the map is basically we couldn't fully clean it up until we knew everything the map had to do. Mm -hmm. And so there's one of the frustrating things about ARCs as a project is that we, ha we have had to consistently revise the foundations of the design as we realize like, oh, we yeah. need, in this plot line, we need the game to do this. Okay, let's go back and like build another part of the foundation in. And it was really only in the last month that the core dev team was able to say like, okay, Here's the actual true hierarchy of information that needs to be present in the map. Here's the, the actual way it needs to, like the, the way pieces need to sit on it so the board can be parsed easily. Right. But all that stuff's clicked into place. So it will, take, it will take a few months of hard work to get it all to a high level of polish, but that work is, is happening and happening at a good pace. That's exciting. Yeah, it's always, this is a fun part of the project, I feel like. I love this, this in the weeds stuff. And Patty blew up some planets. Mm -hmm. Which is all I need to know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. She did. Yeah. We we've had really fun tests. They've just been enjoyable. It's not gonna ever do in Stellaris because I always think what a waste. What a waste. Yeah, it's probably a good planet. planet. Yeah. I'll just take it over. So, um, little factions. What are the little factions? What are the little factions? Uh, old Zen gamer, can you better not better? Can you restate your question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not saying say bad. Judgy. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to <laughs> insult anyone, especially a Zen gamer. But yeah, uh, comment on the Twitter comment of little factions. I talked. Was one, it me that talked about little factions? I talked one point about the factions being like root factions, which uh -huh. is still very much true. Um, huh. But all right, uh, we can we can follow it up, and uh, after Patrick talks about Path, we will certainly have time for general Q and A. Speaking of Path, let's, tell, let's talk about let's Path. talk about Path. Uh, so I want you to tell me to slow down if I'm going. If I'm just blah, that's all right. I'm excited right now, and I'm very caffeinated. Uh, what? All right. Anyway, um, so I've been working on Path again, and um, well, I've been working on it the whole time. So we kept going weird crossroads. We let's talk about. I I uh, I was getting a little frustrated with the design and what I wanted it to be, and I did. I I kept getting to a point where I said, um, "I am. This is it. This is where I want to be." And let's let's go with this version. And then I'd play it some more, and I'd be like, "No, this isn't. This isn't quite telling the story I wanted to tell." And. Um, but probably about 10 days ago, Ted walked into my office after a frustrating day of you know, two versions I was looking at, and I was trying to figure out which of these versions am I going to pick up and work with. And Ted came in, and he set some pieces down on the table, and he said, if this is all you had, mm -hmm. how would you tell the story you want to tell with Path? It doesn't, this doesn't have to be what you have, but if this is all you had at this moment, well, how would you tell the story the same story? And, and that was, uh, that really worked well, because... What it spoke to is something I talk about in design called naturalism, where everything is represented on the table as one piece or one thing or one one part of whatever it is. So I think owner emphasis very well because a card is part of the progress you need to get through the maze. And you, you can very like you don't play a card as five of those, you don't play it as seven of those. Mm -hmm. You play it as one part of the information. And or chess. You don't you don't know that you don't have a card off board that says a knight has three strength. You just know a knight is a knight's a knight. And uh, and so I started reworking Path with that in mind, and knowing that we'd still have to break away from it at some point. The knight would still have to have three strength, but sure. as much as we could get on the board, we were gonna we were gonna tell on the board. So we started reworking Path as an open world adventure game within this world where um, every hex can be occupied by one piece or multiple of the same kind of piece. And and that's how we started reworking it. And uh, I think what came out was was pretty smooth. I really I really liked what came out of the process. I think there were earlier versions that could have been workable. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the one that I've been the most sure. en entranced with and most enamored with. So uh, Nick Brockman, we handed off the um, we handed off the map to Nick. Um, he took a pass on it, brought a new map map out and um, started playtesting with that map. And it's been pretty good since then. So um, basically, the adventures are on the map. They take up a hex, as, as advertised on the, on the tin. 
There is wall pieces now to represent cities. There's cities and cities and towns on the map. There are soldiers occupying space on the map, and the soldiers get in your way unless you are in line with that faction, some the faction that they represent somehow. And other things, monsters and things like that. So what I've been trying to do is build a open world game where all the prompts for what you can do in the game are present on the map at the beginning of the game in some way. And things will start to appear, but um, things will start to appear during the game. But for the most part, if something is on, the, if something's on the board at the beginning of the game, you can interact with it. And that's been working out pretty well. So, um, so we're working, uh, just we we. We've played every day. Yeah, since, 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 since we had that. Well, there are two. I want to point to two things. So one, the map redraw, I think, is is useful and interesting because you were running into a problem where the number system of your game wasn't allowing you the space to, to tell the stories. Right. Yeah. And like literally, the solution was like double you hexes. Need, you need to double hexes. Yeah. You need to do, or, or double the distances. Right. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. and it, which is I think this is a classic design problem. Right. Where you're like working, working, working. You're like, oh. My combat system only supports the numbers one to through three. Yeah. And you're like, well, that that's enough for a certain kind of game. Right. You know, or, or in the same way that like in Catan, you know, a uh, a settlement can produce one of a thing, a city can produce two of a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted a piece that would produce three of a thing, you'd kind of screw up the whole game. Right. And so like only one or two right. in, in some respects in, in Catan. Um, and there's is there a metropolis in Cities and Nights? There, there is. It is a good. It uh, is a resource. No, they um they give you uh like different special powers. Like you can like okay. get the or or they, they like the, the third thing. The, the metropolis will just give you extra points, but the the third level of each of the tech tracks give you gives you like a bonus. You can right. trade two to one at the aqueduct or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But then okay, so that was one thing, and then the, the second thing is I think path like what I like about this current version of path is at various points in path myself or nick or someone will say like what's special about this game right what why make an open world game in this year of our lord 2023 right. like why make an open world game and this current version of path is the first one that i'm like ah there are no event decks Just which are housing things that players explore off the board you don't you don't walk into space, draw a card, and say, "I'm not fighting a dragon." I'm not fighting a dragon, or like yeah. oh, I'm going to the inn for like an inn encounter. There are no encounter decks. Yeah. And if you look at like pretty much every other open world game, there's a high reliance on encounter decks. Yes. Be, and and they do this to keep the the board state really clean. Right. But then to get it kind of messy when it needs to be messy. And then the way that the modern open world game has kind of navigated this, like galazar or whatever the heck that game's called and western not western legends but um certainly like gloomhaven and splendid vale do this they put all of that world in like books mm -hmm. paragraphs they're like mm -hmm. hiding in other places and I, what i like about path right now is you sit down to play it you look at the board and you're like ah this is everything mm -hmm. and then the one exception of this are like the way the plot cards work yeah yeah so uh, the path cards, which you previously were the cards you would get when you failed to do something correctly, which I liked. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a charm to like, oh, well, you, you failed to do this delivery, but you also, while you were picking up sticks, the farmer came and helped you, and now you can help the farmer and, and so on. Um, so, the, uh, so the path cards, there's currently now three path cards at the top of the, at the, top of the board, and they are... They have a story on them. They have set up directions for them. They have a, they have not not a narrative story, but they but they're telling the story. So, for instance, there's a card that puts a dragon into play. So, a dragon appears on the space called the Vault, which is an ancient dungeon on the map. And uh, while the dragon's in play, anyone can come up and fight the dragon. So, you fight the dragon, you get uh, you get a point of heroics or something. You get you get two bonuses, and then but the dragon will survive. So it's, it's like this ongoing battle with the dragon. At some point in the game, somebody can steal the key from the Ogre King, which is one of the factions in the game. Mm -hmm. so, but that, so you have to be really trusted by the Ogre King to get into, into his good graces, to get, get close enough to the key to steal it, then you steal it. Now the Ogres are mad at you, but you can now fight the dragon. So then you claim, the, you claim that card from the board, and, uh, and now you alone can attack and defeat the dragon and eliminate the dragon from play. Um, as the game goes on, there is a little uh, timepiece that's moving across the uh, across the three path cards. They each have four or five spaces on a track, 
And every time a player plays an action, that advances the time on the track. And every time the counter passes the, um, that character, so every time it passes the dragon, the dragon destroys a piece of the map. So it mm -hmm. flies away, takes, kills one of the soldiers, destroys a wall, whatever, it, whatever it's going to do, and you put that piece now onto the dragon. Um, and so you can go kill the dragon. The dragon will continue to burn things down while you have it in your possession. We, we kind of changed the timing window for that. You haven't seen that yet. Um, but if the dragon gets five pieces stacked up on it, you, it is prompting you now to go to another deck that we're calling the end deck, even though it doesn't... Mm -hmm. it, now, it now can end the game. So as the way that the dragon's written now is you put another card over the top of the dragon that says the dragon's ascendant. And now the dragon is much more destructive you don't need to sneak into its lair to kill it. Anyone can go up to it and kill it. So now, mm. so it's... So it's, this only happens if it doesn't... If it's not slain before it destroys five things, then it becomes ascendant and becomes much more destructive. Mm. And um, then its event phase is it destroys an entire faction. So it just mm. wipes the faction off the board completely whenever it attacks. Uh, but anyone can go up and kill it and claim it uh, without having without, without having to... Do the claiming. What happens first. to the player who had already claimed it if they had already claimed it? Uh, they can still attack. Okay. They can cool. still attack it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's good. I, oh, yeah, that's good. I'm going to put a little fire on there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so then, and then if if it manages to destroy all the factions in the game, the game ends, and then mm -hmm. you go to what? There's another scoring system that it goes to. Um, and so every one of the. I've been writing, rewriting the paths. So that like like the the way that the trolls come out when the dungeons are open, that the, that'll eventually mount to a larger problem. And, and so so is this so essentially they have, and I know you don't like two sided cards, but essentially each one of these has like an yeah. ascendant side. And the only reason I haven't done that yet is because I wanted to leave open the door for a trinary or a, you know, four states or five states within mm -hmm. the same adventure. I see. So I haven't I haven't done. I that see. Either. So there's like or there's like a second reference deck. Yeah, yeah. There's a second reference deck of cards you pull out and put on I top see, of it, and you put it on top of it to change it, and then some of the cards alternatively. So there's there's three path cards. There's now also the herald, uh, who is uh, managing some of the restocking, and it triggers all the path cards that a player is holding. So that they can still get triggered. I see, I see. And that card, if one of the nations gets too strong, that gets covered, and then and then it acts differently um, while that faction's in control of the game. Okay, interesting. Uh, and so, um, so I'm I'm piecing that all together again. So I'm very very happy with how the system is, is working because we we've, we've been able to write all the paths in a way that like, again, it doesn't really, it doesn't it. How do I how do I say this? It's not like you suddenly drop a bunch of pieces on the map. Those pieces have always been there. They're now just changing their relationship with the game and with mm -hmm. each other. So, um, so I uh, yeah, I've been I've been really enjoying that part of it. Um, so yeah, so they they can take control. And then why they go onto the herald card is because if there's a second herald event, mm -hmm. it stacks on top of it, and then it's a now a uh, last in first out kind of thing where that the top event has to be dealt with. I so see. if two nations ascend. You have to deal with the most recent problem. I see, I see. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so I've been working on that, and then um, that's the events. And then, do you want to? Should we talk about the action card? Sure. Yeah. I, I don't know how you change the preparation card yet, so I'm excited to see it. Maybe uh, the preparation. Oh, <laughs> I didn't put the preparation card on the slide, well, so that's we, we that's a, that's all right. So one of the one of the currencies in the game is um, influence, and we're having trouble getting influence to flow into the game quite um, quite enough yet. And so we added a preparation card that lets you uh, go to town and party, which kind of reminds me of the earlier drafts of Oath, where you okay. Could, but does you can you still use to like pull your other cards? Yeah, yeah, and you can pull your other cards out of the, out of the deck. Yeah, yeah. So, can we show that slide there? Yeah. So, uh, and then, so basically, the player's turn boils down to you. You're playing one. You, it's a little bit of hand management. You have eight, eight. You start out the game with eight cards. Here are three of them. Uh, they're pink because I'm using pink sleeves. I will. <laughs> they, they don't. They won't be pink in the final version. Um, I mean, uh, and so um, you have eight cards. You draw. You start with four in your hand, and then you draw one at the end of each turn. Every time you have a skill check against something, so when you're fighting or when you're dungeon delving or when you're, that's really all the skill checks right now, um, you are risking, you roll, there's two sets of dice you roll. You roll to see if you succeed and you roll to see if you get hit in the encounter. And if you get hit, you have to give up one of your cards from your deck. And if you're out of cards in your deck, you have to give up two cards from your deck. So the longer you go without resting, which resets your deck, the more the faster you'll get damage, basically, as, as you go on. 
Um, otherwise, every turn you play one card and you either move, which is the top half, and it shows um, it shows what symbols on the map you can move across, and then all symbols trade down. So uh, you can, if you're going through grasslands, you can also play a tree to go through grasslands, and then if you're going through, um, there's a mountain symbol which didn't get on the slide. Yeah, it's right there. I'm fighting. Uh, if you are, uh, if you're walking through. Um, and then you, so if you're walking through multiple forests, you can trade a mountain down into a forest and so on. And uh, so, these, so you can either move or you can take the other half of the, um, you can take the other half of the card, which is below the line. Uh, so for instance, on the exploration card, you can, uh, you can take a rune action. On the fighting card, you can move one space regardless of allegiance and then fight whatever fight something that's in that space. Um, I might, uh, and we might still make fighting optional. It might just be you can bully your way through one space and then, mm -hmm. and then continue, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, this like touches on the, on the question about whether or not sneaking should be an element of the game or should be just baked into other things. Yeah, and that's that's that that's kind of your sneaking yeah that, right. your sneaking moment would be uh, you just have to fight your way in. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's all the topics I listed to talk about at this time. I didn't, we weren't going to show the map yet, but um, uh, it is. Um, I'm really enjoying how the how the events are like self fulfilling and they're they're all they're all working with the players, but they don't completely depend on the players for activation. So I'm really enjoying. It. And I'll say, you know, as, as a studio, the, the thing that we're looking at for Path right now is we're trying to figure out, um, like, we have a window for hopefully a, a new crowdfunding campaign uh, th this year. Mm -hmm. And we have three projects. Um, Path is one of them, which could take that slot. And we're just going to wait for a couple weeks and see how it's all piecing together to see which one, which project gets that slot and kind of like how, what the next 12 months or so look like. Yeah. But Path. hopefully we'll know soon. Hopefully we'll know soon. Path's theme is a very uh, just, it's more like adventures in an in a open world, fantasy world right now. Um, no, no techno wizards. That kind of got that got no, stripped they, out. They, they, yeah. they kicked out. That had its day. Uh, but there might still be magic. Um, I think there is a world where, um, as I develop the quest more, there might or not the quest more, the story more. Um, you might be able to replace cards with other cards. Um, and we kind of talked about being able to draft a ninth card into your deck. Hmm. Uh, you and I had talked about that. Like you know, if you're fighting a lot, maybe you want to put a fighting card in sure, your deck sure, and so sure. on. So yeah, cool. All right. So yeah, so we're, uh, we're it'll be up for evaluation very soon. Very soon. Yeah, we yeah. Have, yeah it's all we we try to protect the um, core like design loop so that if a project for whatever reason needs more time, it doesn't have to like go up too quickly. Um, but we are getting close to just having to set what the next things we're going to do. So hopefully we'll we'll have some things sorted out pretty soon. Um, I have a small update on the Oath expansion. Um, we are, uh, we have it out for a provisional quote, um, and I, we basically have like, we have a, a lot of good content that we could reorder, that we could organize into a few different types of expansions. Uh, we need to wait on pricing before we make that decision. I think that I said, probably said something kind of similar to this uh, last month, it's just because this stuff takes time. Uh, but there has been good progress on it. I, I hope it's something that we get to do uh, later this year. I'm, it's been pretty cool to watch. Yeah, it is when fun to watch. Yeah. Um, and then, the, yeah, it, it, there's really good progress happening, and it, it's just one of those things that, um, as arcs winds up, well, winds down for me, the Oath expansion is like the next thing on my on my list. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we're happy to take any final questions before we sign off here today. Yeah, I want to go play Path. Now I talked about it, so yeah, I have. We we have moved our uh, our design schedule for arcs to push versions on Wednesdays instead of Fridays. So this is a very busy day for me. So oh. I, have to, I have to go work on I have to go work on arc stuff. All right. Yeah, uh, do you have any up, uh, that was an update on oath drafting. Yeah. Uh, I, I think everyone loves cards. Any chance of a first and foes reprint? Probably on hold until we address vast. So, the vast elephant in the room. That my, my, my face being aghast was me thinking about the whole vast uh, ecosystem. Yeah, we talked about it at lunch today because what what like I think part of like I think part of what we haven't really thought about is that the root audience has grown so much since Vast Mysterious Manor mm -hmm. that maybe if we did another Vast or Oath campaign we could get it in the front of a lot more people I agree. than we could previously. And so uh, and so part of, you know, 
you don't know this, I guess, but like part of what we think about Vast when we talk about Vast is how can we bring it all into one product again or we release it again as one thing, one system, because when we made it, we were I was excited about expansions for it, but I didn't really plan. It wasn't that designed. Much. It wasn't designed that way. Yeah. yeah. And so we have to we would have to start over and remake it in a way that we could do that and have Nick, me, you, Josh, possibly a new person take it over for a very long time yeah. to get it, that to work correctly. It's a big project. I mean, I think, like, it's funny because I, Nick and I have talked about it because I think he has a way that he could do it, that he imagines doing it. I have a way that I imagine doing it. I'm, I'm sure you have a I'm sure I, I'm uh, sure I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so and I think that it's, it's one of those where uh, it's just, it's a massive project. It's something that we're, we're probably going to talk a lot about next year because it'd be, ni- it'd be nice to do. I think everybody in the studio would want to work on it. Yeah. But, I mean, it's a project that we all like. Right. Um, it's just... I, you know, we, we don't want to act like it's a small project. So we don't, we don't um, want to just... Well, and, and this is why we have hesitated to reprint vast things. Because we could yeah. just print. Yeah, we just print it. But yeah. we don't want to get to the end of that and say, oh, by the way, we're doing a new edition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Buy it uh, again. Uh-uh. Um, the, uh, is, is vast simply part of the uh, conversation? I'll say the, the, one, the one commonality, I think, in all the approaches is to create a, a core grammar that's strong enough to support all the games that would be slightly simpler it would certainly be simpler than its present presentation Mm -hmm. but it would be um just more knobby so that it would be easier to design factions for so more like built around a a root style system or something uh there was a couple questions any Uh, root so any root uh that's like next year next year we'll we'll, we'll, we'll probably i I imagine we might start working on a little bit this year but Mm -hmm. uh it'll that's probably a next year thing um for the ARCs update, just digital. Um, the print and play updates, a print and pl- I, as someone who has built a lot of ARCs campaign kits, they're so big. I mean, it's like 100 pages of cards, y'all. Like, I don't, like, I mean, it's just so, there's just so much. Um, and uh, I just hesitate. To, I, I don't even know if we're going to do like an official PMP. Everybody has ARCs. to buy a wide format printer. Yeah, and print it, print out hundred cards at home. Well, I, I think you know what. What I'll say about it is, I think that we might do an updated P and P for the core game at some point in the summer. For the campaign game, I just don't know. I, it, it's just a, it's just a ton of work, and it, the, the 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 part of it that is a bummer is it's a lot of work, and then as soon as you're done, it's out of date. Right. It's just out of date. It's like, whereas what we'd like to do with the Arcs Digital Kit is what what we do with the Oath Kit. Which is basically uh, right now we, we have um, this. Is, I, could, I could talk about arcs testing strategies forever, but the we have this like two kit system for arcs. What I what I kind of want to do, um, if possible, is once we do the arcs public release for for TTS, that will be the one version of arcs, mm-hmm. and we will. If you want to update to the most recent version of the game, you. Turn on you, you turn off caching and it will load all the new cards. Uh-huh. Um, but we're going to keep that live and updating probably sure. through the end of the project. Uh, Any hints for we do? Path doesn't make the crowdfunding. I'll uh, no. I probably won't be here anymore if Path doesn't get the funding because <laughs> yeah. I'll be so sad. Uh, uh, and then if we have any small box games coming up, I no. I'll pitch a few this this fall. But yeah, but, but we don't have anything close yeah. to the schedule. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are other expansions and things that we're, we're looking at uh, that we'll talk about later, probably yeah. next month. Yeah. Cool. All right, that's it. Well, take care, everybody. Have a lovely May. I'm, I'm it's it's sort of the too. best month in Minnesota. It's I, sorry. Love, I love May. May <laughs> in Minnesota is incredible. Uh, it's been so gloomy all the way through April, too, except for that one 80-degree period. Yeah, and then no, it's, 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 that's it, nice. It is straight glorious out there now. All right, well, take care, everyone, and we'll see you all next month. See ya.